Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tell Your Story. My name is Todd Nesloni, and I'm your host. And this is the video and podcast series based after my book, Stories from Web, where I find different people that I have either met in person or found on social media who I think their stories will inspire you. I have a special guest this week, and I'm thrilled to have him on, and that is Daniel Patterson. Daniel, why don't you kind of tell everybody who you are? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Todd, for having me on. Uh, my name is Daniel. I live in California, and I'm a former teacher and principal of 14 years um, and turned author, speaker, and teen life coach. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time right now in sort of crisis management in the mental health and substance abuse space for kids and uh, recently started running a day school up in West Los Angeles for um, kids coming out of treatment in high school before they go back to high school. So, so you're not busy at all, right? Right. <laughs> I'm not that busy. I just got back from uh, Canada. I was up in Canada oh, giving wow. a keynote this weekend, and uh, that was my first time traveling international to speak. That's so that awesome. was, uh, yeah, it was exciting. It was, uh, the Canadians are wonderful people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I take back all of my jokes about Canada. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> so Daniel, so you were an educator for many years. Is that something you always wanted to do? Yeah, I was always interested in education. My parents, my dad was a principal. My mom was a teacher, very classic kind of education mm -hmm. family. My older brother's uh, an assistant superintendent. And every, everyone in our family is either lawyers or teachers, mm -hmm. um, basically. So I started teaching seventh grade English, and I did that for 10 years. And then I was an assistant principal of a high school for four years. So how did that lead to you deciding to kind of step out of education and into, I mean, you're still dealing with kids and all right. that kind of way, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different role than being a teacher or an assistant principal. Yeah, it sort of was a perfect storm. Um, I have a, I don't have a sexy story, but I have a story, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing salacious, but I was very happy in education and I thought I'm going to do this for a hundred years. I'll be a principal forever. Um, and then I got sober, which is interesting. So four years ago, just over four years ago, I got sober. Um, and that was a really big shift for me. Um, mm -hmm. quit drinking and just wanted to focus on family. My oldest daughter, I have three kids. My oldest daughter was three at the mm -hmm. time. Um, and so when I quit drinking, I needed an outlet. And mm -hmm. so I started writing again because I was an English teacher. Um, and then I started just writing social commentary pieces and I, um, submitted one to Ariana Huffington's personal assistant at the time who had worked his way up through the Huffington post, who was sort of the chief content officer there. Uh -huh. Um, and on the same day that my article, my first article was published, my best friend commit suicide. Um, oh, wow. so it was the highest high, the lowest low. It was gnarly. Right. But in that moment, I felt like I needed to make meaning out of that. I needed right. to um, figure out what I was doing with my life. And I, I already had this immense sense of freedom from like my addiction and, and that path that I had broken free from. So I just kept um, catching opportunities as they came to me and just keeping an open mind about it. And I didn't end up leaving um, education. That happened in April. And I left my job in December of the following school year. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, you said that you became sober, sober four years ago. Right. What, what did that look like? Was it just a, a social drinker? Was it a drink every night? Like what did, what do you mean by became sober? Uh, that was a drink, many drinks every night uh, for since college, basically. Right. Um, my, you know, I, I functional, super right. responsible, good at my job. I didn't go to work drunk. Um, didn't make any bad choices, no DUIs, mm -hmm. nothing. So I don't have like a sexy story really, but right. I felt like, you know, the, the saying that I like with it is that I had the first drink and the second drink had me. Mm -hmm. So it really, it, it, it was sort of pacifying my own anxieties and instead of treating them with therapy and things that I do now, um, it was just this vicious cycle and it just would get worse. You know, it was like, happy drink, sad drink, stress drink, bored drink, celebrating drink. Like it just became this huge grip on me. Um, I still have tons of friends that go out and do that mm -hmm. and not to, not to the degree where it's a problem, but social drinkers, you know, right. nor 
normal humans, but that wasn't me anymore. Mm -hmm. And when my daughter was three, I just felt like I got to make a change. Um, so I just was like, okay, I'm just going to stop for, you know, 30 days, 60 days. And then there was almost a high on that. Like, okay, I can do another 30 days and another 30 days and another. And then once I hit the year mark, all bets were off. So, you know, being someone who, when you were in that cycle of, of the drinking, did you know and understand that it was addiction at that time? Or when did that become a realization to you that this is something that I want to change? Uh, no, I knew. I knew the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's just that denial city. You know, everyone, right. lives, everyone lives there. It's a shell game. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, I felt like, well, I kind of, I deserve it, right? Because I'm doing well. I'm winning awards for my education. I'm a good teacher. I'm being promoted. I have a good job providing for my family, bought a house. Like, so you could just line it up behind the excuses of, of indicators that we w treat with, Oh, if, if they have this, 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 then, then you can do those things. But mm -hmm. as long as you're not arrested or losing your job or, you know, so I, mm -hmm. I kind of played that shell game for a long time. Right. Uh, and then even in, even in that moment where I decided to, to stop and, and now I talk about it, right. But I didn't talk about it at the time and I didn't advertise that I was doing it because there's so much shame right. involved, just feeling like such a failure in that space. Um, and I thought no one, I'm like, there's no one that's sober. I don't. And then when I stopped, I realized there were so many people in this world, um, that are, mm -hmm. and, uh, it's always still an adjustment, just learning how to, kind of traverse life um, yeah. and like watching the Super Bowl, realizing how many beer commercials are on. <laughs> I never noticed until I got sober. Uh -huh. um, but just living in a society that's very drink heavy mm -hmm. um, and that's not judgy. I don't mean right. it to be judgy. If it sounds that way, um, people should do, do them. Right. But right. for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't a winning formula. And I really do know that that was when my life began to change and then uh once there was the death and and the published article um that's when sort of the next chapter began so uh, this is an interesting um idea to me i mean not idea but conversation because you know you realize you have a problem it's still a very personal in your home, in your family kind of thing. Right. When, and then you decide to get sober. When does it become a point that you feel comfortable enough taking this really private thing and being brave enough to have that conversation publicly because of the fact there are so many people who struggle with sobriety? Right. I just, I mean, for me, it was this tangled web of anxiety, depression, and substance abuse. And it's sort of not knowing where one begins and the other stops or mm -hmm. starts, you know, it's just who knows what happened first. Um, but for me, what happened was I was at the high school and I was an assistant principal and this nonprofit came onto campus and they're called one on campus. Um, and they said, Hey, we have this restorative justice model intervention um, sort of suspension exchange program that we'd like to pilot at your school. And for kids that get in trouble with drugs or alcohol, instead of suspending them, we'll provide them with education and connection and these big experiences, mentorship. Um, and at that point, I, I brought that onto campus and um, got really involved with them. And, and then I saw it was an opportunity to help kids right. and, and help teenagers who were and are struggling. And that's really my, my passion point are, are the, the ones that everyone else has given up on. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or they're knee deep in their own issues and they're, they're self-medicating. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. That was kind of my shift. Well, you know, I, I love that that's the kind of work you do now is working with those at-risk teens. Um, when did you decide, you know, to take this leap into what you're doing now? Um, I took the leap. I mean, I went on a mental health leave from my job in that December and, um, and then I never went back. Right. So sort of in that time, I had a few months off um, to kind of find my bearings. And uh, I went and rented an office in, in an office park that was kind of in the same neighborhood that my school was. And I just figured I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing at the high school. 
and I'm just going to monetize it and hopefully make an income that's the same as my income I was making as principal. So I don't lose my house and, <laughs> you know, my wife doesn't flip out on me. <laughs> uh, so I, I decided to, and I was doing more sort of academic coaching at, be- at the beginning, college counseling. Um, but the, the, and I still do a lot of that. You know, I work with a lot of kids and everything's great. All systems go, mm-hmm. they're firing on all cylinders and I'm just coaching them, life coaching, educational management, goal setting. Um, but, but as I sort of held space for kids, I started to get more of the kids that they're not sure they need a clinician. The parents aren't sure what to do. They've just been suspended or arrested or expelled. They think they have a problem. And so having been connected in that kind of recovery world and therapy world, I just served as a conduit connecting families to resources. And then that just sort of, it's just grown from there really. Well, and, and you, you mentioned writing for the Huffington Post right. and getting an, on uh, some things posted there. And then that now you have a book out called the assertive parent. That's um, right. And it's fantastic. Um, where, what led you to want to write that? Um, I wanted to write a book that sort of packaged all the advice that I was giving. Um, it's a funny thing, like being in the advice giving business, because a lot of people are like, well, how many teenagers do you have? You know, <laughs> zero. <laughs> I have three kids, but none of them are teens. But I had worked with teenagers for 16 mm-hmm. years at that point. So I did feel well equipped. Um, but also, I, my business model is me, right? And I only work with a few families at a time. So to be able to give that information to a larger audience, larger mm-hmm. platform, I, I wanted to package it together. And so essentially, it's sort of a baby 411 book for teenagers, for right. parents, right? So if, if this happens, try that. Um, it finger wags a little bit, but mostly it's trying to be, you know, be an assertive parent. You don't have to be a helicopter parent, smother them. You don't have to be a free range parent. Let them just run wild, um, mm-hmm. sort of split the difference. Mm-hmm. And it's broken up into four different sections that are pretty relevant and questions that I would answer and still answer all the time in my sort of private practice. So have you gotten any feedback that was unexpected or really positive that really um, uplifted you when you, uh, since it being, since it's been out? Uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like I've gotten good feedback. I'm proud of the book. I, I, I worked really hard on it. I had to rewrite it like three times, um, <laughs> as you know how that goes, yeah. uh, so that my publisher would, would publish it. Um, <laughs> so the feedback has been good. Um, I like to think I'm fairly satirical, funny, comedic. I try to keep it light. Um, they're sweet and salty at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I get, you know, the hate mail, anonymous emails, who are you? Uh, <laughs> you just trolls. Um, yeah. And mostly people who had probably been punished by me when I was the assistant principal, <laughs> you know? So revenge is a dish best served cold, I suppose. Um, so it's, it's taken that like to get thick skin and right. as you're sort of like in the public eye and I'm not in the public eye, but you know, as mm-hmm. I put myself out there that, that is to be expected, I guess. So what has been the most rewarding part of doing the work you're doing now with these at-risk teenagers and their families? I think um, making the, helping them make the shift um, and helping the teenager sort of dig in and understand that there's a lot of people in their corner and there's mm-hmm. a lot of resources. And, and, and having been in sort of traditional comprehensive education, and I think that's a great model when it works, it works really well. Um, but introducing families and kids to alternatives and different online platforms or hybrid platforms or one-to-one platforms or therapeutic boarding schools, or, you know, just that there's so many options, um, towards success and you just have to keep going one day at a time, one solution at a time. And it's trial and error, right? So it's not going to work. And some kids peak in high school and they, they do really well and they have their 4.0 and they're going to go to college and, some kids get C's and D's and have a job and need to go to community college and find themselves. And right. I just want to be a champion for those kids too. So you, you do a lot of work, like we've said, with, with families of at-risk teenagers as well. How does, at what point should, does a family, when they're concerned about their teenager, need to step up and get more involved and maybe seek outside help? I mean, I earlier, the sooner the better. Um, I really think, especially with mental health, I say it's like, it's like the dentist. 
it, it, we get a postcard twice a year that tells us to go get our teeth cleaned or mm-hmm. go take our kids to the dentist. And, and my rule of thumb for families is when you get that postcard for your child, you also book them a clinician appointment, right? So formalize to normalize. We have to get, get under this and, and take away the shame. And when I was in high school, there was no therapy, you right. know, and, and, and I hear a lot of parents say that like, oh, when I was a kid, no one had this and no one had that. Well, that's perfect, but it's not, you know, 1983 anymore right. either. Um, it's 2019 and the struggle is real. Mm-hmm. Um, so a mom and dad's intuition is pretty accurate. And I think there's always that juxtaposition between what they know and what they want to admit. Mm-hmm. So better safe than sorry. It's like if they're struggling in, in an academic class, they'll, they'll sign up a tutor in a hot second. Right. But then if, if there's other signs or symptoms or sleep patterns change or people exhibiting signs of stress, depression, substance abuse, overextension, um, they yeah, can drag, they can drag their what, feet. What are some of the warning signs that parents can look for that they should be paying attention to that their child may be acting out or are asking for help? Well, I'm not a clinician, so I'm on to just clarify that, right? So this is just, it's not clinical advice, people. There you it's go. Just, this is just me sort of in the trenches. But yeah. typically, um, you know, a, a sudden drop in grades, a change of a friend group, um, addiction to uh, social media, reliance on video games as, as a sort of disconnection point, mm-hmm. um, you know, not, not making curfew, all, all of the good ones, but but really that sort of like when they become really aloof and cagey, mm-hmm. um, I typically feel like the kids will, they're just going to throw more gasoline on the fire until their parents wake up and say, Oh, we have to do something. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, people wait way too long mm-hmm. and, um, it's way more efficient. Even if, even if it's uncomfortable, it's more productive to be proactive. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying you, you know, overreact, but certainly, regular steps toward proactive care and, and knowing that there's different levels of care for teens is really important. Well, and I love that the work that you do isn't just with the teenager, but it's also with their family. Cause I think right. it's so important for families to not just throw the kid into help and right. not have any part of it at all. Because especially when you're dealing with teenagers, there's already so much angst and, and blame and all this other stuff they want to throw around that right. it's something really important to do together. Right. I try to, I, I use a parallel coaching model. So I, I meet with the kids every week um, individually, but I'm then also you know, having a phone call and, and going over the report and, and looking at next steps and reactions with the parents in real time. So, you know, a lot of it is this sort of codependency, if you will, or the synergy that you're trying to create. And it's setting boundaries. Sometimes in a high performing community, it's really getting parents to take a step back, right? you know, and, and get perspective that, the grade point average or the college admission or the ACT score or the varsity team or not, you know, those don't need to be the markers that we use um, to determine the worth or the value um, of the child. So, or sometimes it's getting the parents to lean in like they're asleep at the wheel and Hey, you know, you got to get more involved. You got to take more precaution, more action. So um, what has been one of your coolest moments, and, and and this new path that you're on? Uh, one of the coolest moments I think for me was I was working with a, a teenager uh, for a long time who had his own unique path and um, came out of a pretty intense period. Let's just call it that. And anyways, I was able, he, he through the process, it became clear he was super interested in film and filmmaking so I reached out to a director named Sam Levinson and Sam Levinson has a new show on HBO that he's producing and directing called Euphoria and they're filming it right now. And Sam has a, has his own story. Right. And so, um, he was gracious and he allowed me to bring the boy up and we spent a night on the set That's and he, so cool. and he let him watch him direct and, and explain what he was doing. And it was just kind of this, you know, allowing t- allowing him to see, okay, Hey, this can be you in six, mm-hmm. seven years. Um, just keep going. Right. So that's an example of one of the cooler experiences I've had in that. Although there's, there, there are many, you know, if there are parents looking to go somewhere online for some advice 
or some resources, is there a place that you typically send them to? Um, you know, that the internet is a scary place. Yeah. So I don't typically, uh, prefer parents Google anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I would say that, you know, I'm a big fan of, of using your existing network and trying to make it work in your own zip code. So it's also just, uh, I help parents clarify, like, how to communicate with the school or, you know, how do you reach out to the school psychologist or their guidance counselor? How do you obtain a 504? Or, you know, how do you run your insurance so that you can understand who, who's in network for therapy if you need therapy? Um, and, then, and then, of course, my own website. <laughs> well, but I, think that, I think that's such good advice, though, for parents is that don't jump straight to Google no. because it's so, like you said, I mean, it's not like the internet's dangerous and a scary place, but you can go down a rabbit hole right. believing something just because you read it online when it's not true at all about your kid or your family. Right. And the thing with, particularly with mental health and substance abuse, is that they are really taboo. Right. Mm -hmm. So people keep their cards extremely close to their vest. However, what I've discovered through just my own path is that there's so many people like like me now, like, you know, that now I've walked this path of mental health and substance abuse and I'm and I'm doing well. There's nothing I love more than helping someone through that. And, And so I feel like when parents can even reach out in their own network, they would be blown away by the amount of people who are also sort of suffering in silence. Mm -hmm. Um, through that, who, who are maybe further ahead in the journey and have access to resources. So, um, there is a good book that parents read called the parallel process, which Mm -hmm. talks about, you know, how to deal, how to support your child as they're walking through their process and help you deal with your own. That is a good book for parents. Yeah. Well, you know, I love the the point you make because it seems to be a recurring theme in this uh, series is that, you know, when you open up and reach out to those around you and start sharing those pieces, you find that there's so much more connection there and people who are willing to help or have experience in areas that they haven't publicly talked about. And so I think that's why it's so important that we are out there sharing these pieces, however uncomfortable they may be, because there can be so much benefit that comes from not keeping it all in. Yeah. I mean, I think part of my, the book, the book I started to write that didn't end up getting published, which is, which will be the next book that I publish. You know, I spent, I, I wrote the first hundred pages of it were just about me and my life as a child and the trauma and the drama and, and, and the happy times too. It wasn't all bad. Um, but that was so much like personal therapy for me just to write it, even though I didn't end up getting published. And that also gave me the confidence to understand, um, you know, maybe I'm holding on to things too much and I got to move on and move past it and move through it. Um, but I was no longer ignoring it, right. which was important for me. Yeah. Right. Well, Daniel, if there was one thing that you would hope people hear from your story or hear from this conversation, what would that be? Wow. That's a big question. Um, I guess one is if you know, you know, and so if, you know, if you, in your heart, you know that you're suffering and that you need help, whatever that looks like. Um, be brave and, and get help and, and reach out to those around you. Because I think, you know, when I finally called it, a lot of people around me are like, yeah, I know. <laughs> About time, <laughs> right? So not the big secret I thought it was, apparently. Yeah. Um, so I think that is be brave. And also, um, let's not define our teenagers by the product facing markers and metrics that we like to shove on them and cram on them and understand that our teenagers are resilient and they're kind and they're creative and, and they've come up in a world that's very different than even when I grew up in. Um, so it's time to acknowledge that. I think it's time to acknowledge that in our systemic school system and the way that we do business and the way that we reward certain markers so I think, look, at the end of the day, if your kid is happy and healthy and brave and compassionate and kind and they have all C's, you should be happy. You there should you be go. holler, holler. 
<laughs> I love it. Well, Daniel, I am so happy that I got to talk to you tonight and share some of your story. I've been following you for a couple of years and we've had different interactions and I love your book and I love all the amazing quotes and, and positivity that you just put out there through social media. Oh, so thank you. thank you so much for everything that you do that shines a light on sometimes these things that not everybody is comfortable talking about. So I, I appreciate you so much, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all that you do and your advocacy and your work. And it's great to connect. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for watching or listening to another episode of Tell Your Story. You can check out a new episode every week on Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, or iTunes. Don't forget to find a way to get out there and be brave enough to tell your story because every story matters. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.